Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon and uh, good evening, depending on where you are in the road. Thank you for attending another Indusoft webinar. Uh, we are really excited today. We're going to be talking about well visualization webinar. It's a webinar, uh, it's more directed towards the oil and gas industry. And uh, here's our agenda. My name is Andre Bastos. I'm going to introduce the company Indusoft. I'm going to talk a little bit about the solutions that we offer with our flagship product Indusoft Web Studio, mainly the things that would be helpful on the oil and gas industry. And I'm going to present a couple of case studies, uh, successful stories of people that used Indusoft Web Studio on their oil and gas solution. And then we're going to have a very special guest is Dr. Eric uh, Van Oort. He's a professor at the University of Texas here in Austin. He's a professor in petroleum engineering, as you can see. And then he'll talk a little bit about his background, uh, how he applies his knowledge. Uh, he worked for Shell for several years, and now he's been teaching at the University of Texas. And uh, he's going to share his knowledge with us as well. So it's going to be a very interesting. So stay tuned. I guess you guys are going to like this webinar a lot so i'm going to start talking a little bit about the typical architectures where you can apply into soft web studio so first you're gonna have a controller you're gonna have a plc that's gonna be controlling let's say your compressor or your drilling machine or something like this and every single machine you need to have an interface to that plc so the software that you're gonna run on that interface is gonna be a local hmi and can be in the soft web studio that's one of our solutions what are you going to run there you can use an embedded system for example windows 7 embedded or you could use the windows ce in different versions you can still use in the soft same development same uh same tools that you use to develop for a pc application you can use for embedded system as well and here on the side you're going to see that you can store the data that you are acquiring from that field from that plc into a database any relational database doesn't matter if you're talking about sql server or if you're talking about uh, uh oracle it can be any operating system so that's a typical one but sometimes you may want to have a secondary hmi not necessarily showing the same screens as the first one but getting the same data so you don't need to have an entire runtime on that secondary HMI. You can use a secure viewer thin client connected to the first local HMI. So you can uh, maintain only one project, only one runtime application. That would be your local HMI. So if you need to modify screens, things like that, you do on the local HMI, you download to the local HMI. The secure viewer is just the visualization part. You can be on different screens. You can even be on different time zones and different language languages on secure viewer. But the secure viewer is not talking directly to the PLC. It would be a secondary HMI talking to the local HMI. That's the one that's acquiring data from the PLC and storing the data into the database if you want to do that. So on the top of that, that local HMI can also be a server for remote visualization that remote visualization you have basically two options you could have a web thin client that would be inside in art explorer you would open the same as a secure viewer so you could see all the screens you could navigate the same way as you have configured originally the application but you have also a solution based on adcml5 called the mobile access thin client that we short for ma thin client that doesn't have to be in art explorer can be any browser that supports ADTML5. So I'm talking about Safari, I'm talking about Google Chrome, IE 9 and up. So all those browsers, they support ADTML5. There you can see tag values, you can see alarm information, you can see trend curves, and you can see specific screens. So depending on how you develop the screen, you can even see that screen on ADTML5, on uh, what we call our mobile access thin client. And as we uh, evolve the, this architecture, you could have a cloud-based server connected to that local HMI, and then you can have access for uh, this project worldwide. So not only the cloud server could be connected to the local HMI, but could also go directly to the PLC 
if we want to do that of course as we're talking about a cloud-based server you're gonna have all the security here with the uh with the firewalls of the security here and you can have again web thin client and mobile access thin client that's a typical architecture where you can use in the soft web studio from the bottom to the top of your solution so here are some of the advantages we are and easy, we have a product that is easy to use, easy to configure, a simple HMI if you want to have just a couple of push buttons to turn on and off, it's very simple to do that. But if you want to create a complex SCADA or OEE solution, you have the same tool to do all that as well. Here you see some screenshots where you have our development environment here on the right. The programming language is uh, VBScript. So if you want to write any scripts, it's on a very well-known language called VBScript. And, uh, you can find samples on how to do things on the web. Uh, we support to host uh, several different type of uh, images. So let's say that you develop an uh, image using Inventor, AutoCAD or something like that. You can, we can host those images here at Indusoft. And uh, we run on any Microsoft operating system. So we're talking about Windows 7, 8, uh, 2000 embedded 7, uh, CE6, 5, 7, and all the server solutions. We are now already uh, certified for Windows 8 as well, uh, working towards the uh, server 2012. So it's a good thing because that's going to give, as you're going to see on the other slide, platform independency. You can develop an application to run on a specific kind of hardware. Let's say that you're developing an HMI and you're going to run that on an embedded system from a certain manufacturer. If you want to change uh, for another manufacturer for whatever reason, you don't need to redevelop your entire software as what happens with other proprietary systems. Okay, what you're seeing on this slide here is uh, actual screens from real projects. So it goes all the way down to mobile to uh, panels uh, where you know you have very limited space, but you still have very uh, a very powerful tool to control your machine, to control your system. Two, uh, local HMI, like, like we were talking about, very commonly used on machines. So all the machine builders, they can take advantage of our solutions, all the way up to highly redundant SCADA, OE, and MES systems. As you can see, every single Windows uh, flavor is supported here for the runtime. As we mentioned on a previous slide, if you want to have a remote management that is uh, platform independent, you can use our mobile access to visualize and even act on your process using any other uh, any other operating system on the market and we are very proud to keep your investment protection uh, when we launched the product Indusoft back in 1997 Windows CE was in, on its first version with we didn't see a 1.0 back then we had Windows 95 not even 98 and Windows NT and uh, that was our first version CE view a 1.0 Nowadays, we are on Windows 8. We are on the CE View version 7.1, about to release the Service Pack 2. And uh, with the CE 567, the same project created back in 1997 it still runs today in our current version. You don't need to do re engineering, you don't need to have a conversion tool or anything like that. Whatever you develop in any Indusoft version, you can open on the latest version. And we are committed to keep this compatibility. So if you use uh, Indusoft, current version today and uh, two years from now we have a newer more advanced version you will not lose all the project that you created you're going to be able to reuse it the way it is you're just going to open we're going to resave it on the newer version you don't need to do any re-engineering reconfiguration for that you're very proud of that because if you compare with some other tools that are in the market they may make you uh okay you can import this part only but you have to edit this you have to recreate all that we don't want to do that. We don't want you to need to uh, redesign your project. Otherwise, you're going to start rethinking, okay, if I need to redesign it, let me look somewhere else. No, you can keep uh, using Indusoft products because your investment is protected. And we have a very powerful database interface. We have a patent on it. And uh, this allows you from any runtime that you have running Indusoft on any platform to store and retrieve data from any relational database. So I'm talking about if you have a, a high uh, redundant server with Windows Server 2012, saving data to SQL Server, that's, you know, that's something that everybody can do. But what if you have a 
Panel PC running Windows CE, acquiring there from the PLC, can I still store this data to my SQL Server? Yes, using our database interface, you can store data from any uh, any runtime of Indusoft Web Studio to any relational database. And here are some examples of real uh, applications. We have uh, several customers using Oracle, Sybase, uh, MySQL, SQL Server 2012 now, not only 2008 or 2005. And this all goes through uh, ADO.net. And we allow you to create a very easy integration to any ERP system because of that database interface. You're seeing here some uh, applications, even though you may say demo here, we're talking to actual uh, devices and actual database is storing a big quantity of data and displaying them there. And uh, several applications communicate with SAP through the database interface and nowadays also through the OPC UA connectivity that we offer as well as SAP offers as well. And uh, you know, with Indusoft Web Studio, again, you can go all the way down to the PLC, all the way up to the ERP using just one product. And this allows you to create very powerful dashboards and OEE. So one of the products that we currently offer is our uh, template, the Business Intelligence Dashboard. That's one of the products you can acquire from us. That's using Indusoft products. Or you can create your own OEE dashboard. We have demo applications that you can look and see how we build that. That's the one on the right here. You know, you can download and see how we did that. Or the one on the left, you can buy our dashboard. It's very easy to configure, just by five steps, and you're gonna have your data being saved on the database and seen on this pie chart, on this Pareto, and things like that. So on this slide here, you can see the whole deployment of Indusoft Web Studio. We saw something similar like this when we were talking about the typical uh, architecture, but this gives you the whole big picture you can have a server running here, or the server could be the local HMI, could be a headless device where you have an embedded system just acquire, acquiring data, let's say on a remote uh, platform, you're just acquiring the data and gonna send this data for radio somewhere. Let's say to a uh, control room with several applications running at the same time, collecting a lot of data. And once the data made it to the runtime system, you can use several solutions for the mobile access, for the uh, thin client access. So it could be the mobile access, could be our secure viewer. As I mentioned before, that would be all the visualization module, but you can be on different screens, different languages, completely independent from what is running on the runtime. Or the web thin clients use Internet Explorer. Again, you can have the whole application running on the web thin client, switching screens and uh, choosing even different languages differently from what is here down here on the server or up here on the cloud and we have very successful stories of people using the SCADA on the cloud as i'm going to show in just a couple of slides and this is like here we are uh, uh, particularly proud of to introduce our mobile access thin client with adcml5 with support for screens now on our search pack 2 that is you know is about to be released in uh in a few hours or you know, a couple of days. So uh, this gives you the freedom to visualize your process on any browser that supports ADCML5. So that goes to iPad, that goes to any tablet using uh, Android or the new Windows 8, Windows 8 RT. These are all the platforms that we've been testing now and you know, it's working pretty well. And uh, why is you support the old, uh, what we call the tabular thin client with ADCML1 for uh, uh, not so smartphones, if I may call that, where you can still have access to your alarms and to uh, process values. And on that, on those process values, you can even write values to your process if you want the user to do that. And we have a huge uh, base of uh, database of communication drivers and, and as well as support to all the flavors of OPC. So we have OPC DA server and client. We have OPC UA with support to redundancy. We have OPC.NET, OPC XML, XMLDA, uh, the client part. We have built-in on the product 
more than 200 communication drivers to all the Allen Bradley, Siemens, uh, GE, Fanuc. So if on your process you're using GE, Fanuc, can we talk to it? Yes, we can. But instead of using Control Logics, we have the driver on the product. No RS links required. And unless you would rather use a uh, OPC solution for, you know, there are different reasons and different uh, cases where you should use a, an OPC. If you want to just talk directly to the PLC, we have the driver in the product as well. And uh, we are releasing the driver for even the ABB Total Flow. I know it's uh, very used on the playing gas industry as well. So we have Control Logics, we have uh, G Fanuc, Siemens, Total Flow, even Triconics. We have all of that on the product itself. So you don't need to install anything extra unless you want to do that because of, you know, your system architecture. We have native TCP IP communication between the stations as well as gateway to other SCADA systems. So you can use Indosoft to talk and communicate with uh, iFix or with uh, uh, Invences Wanderer in touch. Everything, you know, uh, the product supports all that. As I mentioned before, native interface to databases. And uh, you can even buy our APIs to uh, connect your own application to our tags, for instance. So let's say that you have uh, another application, an MES system that you have in there, or a rule-based system, and you want to talk to uh, the tags that are in the software studio. You can uh, just install either a DLL or an XVX and access our tags database. This is this API is part of the product, okay? And everything else is also mobile access and web ready. So a little bit about our case studies here. In our website, if you go to our website under marketing, uh, as you uh, move your mouse over marketing, you're going to see the first option that says case studies here. As you go there, you're going to see uh, two uh, case studies, one from Micon Systems, which is now a uh, Rockwell company. They, they, they acquired uh, this company a, a while ago, and they build compressors, uh, actually control for compressors, they use in the soft web studio. You're gonna see some screenshots there where they use that on mobile devices as well as to monitor several compressors at just, at just one central station. You know, the whole search control system happens here, all using native tools inside in soft web studio, as well as the one in Egypt on the Gulf of Suez, the Jason oil company is a very interesting a case study of oil and gas that is using in the soft web studio and more recent we have uh my pond controls that created their product they call the iSCADA that they took that SCADA system to the cloud so if you go to our website and look for this specific Vipon controls you can download the pdf if you want and uh, that's a very interesting case study on using in the soft web studio to monitor uh, a very complex oil and gas system where they saved, as you can see here, they reduced the cost up to 90% for hosting their SCADA system on the cloud that Indusoft allows you to do that, okay? So this is another case study that I'm just showing here because we are monitoring several points on the University of Texas and you're gonna have a professor of the University of Texas talking to us in just a few minutes where we are talking to every single uh, meter on every single building on the University of Texas here in Austin, creating a data collection system and monitoring everything that is going on on the utilities there. So electricity and water, water temperature, water level, all of that using in the soft web studio. Okay. This is another screenshot. So you can see here uh, the, the total accumulated of energy here on the right and uh, you can see the uh, the trend chart here on the left so you have the chilled water electrical we've seen we have here uh, whatever building that you go and you click you're gonna display the picture on the right so in this case we are showing the Frank Irvin Center that's where the University of Texas basketball team uh, plays okay so everything monitored through in the soft web studio so I'm gonna invite now our very, very special guest, Dr. Eric Van Oort. He's a Lancaster professor in petroleum engineering at the University of Texas and petroleum and geosystem engineering. So he's going to talk uh, a little bit about his experience and the how you could apply Indusoft on the oil and gas industry. He got 
tons of experience as i mentioned he works for for shell before maybe i guess for 20 years or so so uh let me just pass the ball to him right now okay good well good morning everyone um my name is eric van Oort. i'm um, a tenured professor in petroleum engineering at uh, the university of uh, texas at austin um my my background is in in, in drilling and uh, and completions of uh, oil and gas wells, and uh, as Andre already said, I've been with the um, with Shell Oil Company for 20 years, and um, came to uh, UT last year to uh, go back to teaching and doing uh, research and, and development. Um, at UT, I'm continuing to work on the subjects that I was working on when I was at Shell, and uh, what you see is kind of the transition phase from the work that was done at Shell and, and is now uh, also being worked at at, uh, at, at UT and Austin. Um, we're sure we talk, talk about two things uh, where we have potential applications for uh, for Windows self uh, software, um, and one is is well visualization or rather well data visualization. Uh, it's a rather passive um, application, but I'll, I'll show you it's um, it's tremendous value to the oil and gas industry when applied uh, properly. And then secondly, we'll talk a little bit about uh, rig automation. Um, we're at really a crossroads in the oil and gas industry right now where we, we see that we need to, um, at an accelerated pace, need to start adopting rig automation more. And, um, and there's some very interesting developments going on there. And again, uh, in the soft, uh, software capabilities. Uh, could play an important role there. So, uh, a little bit about, about Shell. Um, while at Shell, I was um, team leader of um, the Global Real-Time Operations Center uh, de deployment, and uh, in this graph, you kind of see the spider web of um, operations centers that, that Shell built around the world with major real-time operating centers in um, in the U.S., in, in New Orleans and, and Houston, with full redundancy and, and failover capability, such as the cost of, of doing a business in an area where you could be hit by, by hurricanes. Um, so we needed that redundancy there in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, a uh, hub in, in Aberdeen, Scotland, uh, mainly covering uh, north city operations and, and uh, European activity. I have the Nigeria uh, for Shell's extensive uh, work in, in Nigeria, both onshore and offshore. Um, have in the Middle East in Oman, and then one in, in Miri. Now, it would be too much to give you kind of a detailed overview of what, what these hubs were doing, um, but just for those of you that are not familiar with the real operating centers, um, the, the objectives of a real operating center as applied in the oil and gas industry, particularly in the in the drilling space, is essentially twofold. It is uh, ensuring um, excellence in well planning, something that you could co uh, cover really simply with the phrase "drilling the right well." So, what is the right well to drill? And so, using multidisciplinary collaboration, 3D subsurface visualization, well visualization doing extensive offset well analysis, detailed well engineering modeling, and so on to really determine what is the absolute best well to drill. And then taking those learnings, those models, um, over to the execution phase, and then really focusing on monitoring the well in real time, doing 24 seven monitoring, trend analysis, actual versus plan comparisons, and so on. And then through suitable means, uh, delivering that data, that analysis, to decision makers worldwide, wherever they may be. Um, that part we call drilling the well right. So we, um, we, we've decided what is the right well to drill, now we need to focus on excellence and execution. And the way this is facilitated is that data is gathered at the rig site uh, through suitable data acquisition systems the, um, uh, the the data is typically format, formatted in, in uh, either WITS or WITSML format. 
in the future we also will expect OPC to become more important as a data standard, particularly with respect to automation, and I will get back to that. Um, that data is then analyzed in the uh, in the RTOC. Um, I'll show you some, some examples of, of uh, visualization and analysis techniques that are applied. And then suitable advice is going back to the rig to make sure that it operates safely, that it stays away from what we call non-productive time or trouble events, that the operation is, is uh, conducted as efficiently as, as possible. And, and the nice thing about these uh, new software systems that are, uh, are now available, and that can be deployed, for instance, through web-based interfaces, browsers, and, and, and so on, is that you can really deliver much better business decisions through the right information at the right time to the right people, wherever they are. Um, and, and this actually provides a solution for companies like Shell, um, where they have experts spread all over the globe, and they may be in any location. And it is usually, historically, it's been very difficult to get these people to, for instance, focus on an operation that may be uh, happening in a certain area. The old model typically was, well, if you need a certain skill, a certain discipline of a certain individual in a certain place, and you need that physically move that individual over to that location, uh, take him or her and, uh, and their whole family and, and, and transport them and turn them into expats and, and so on. That is really not necessary any, anymore uh, with, with this technology. Um, everyone can essentially be a real-time satellite if you um, had, uh, had access to, um, to Shell's information, I can essentially give you all the data from any Shell rig operating anywhere uh, uh, on the globe, sitting um, yeah, at a nice, uh, a nice Starbucks, uh, enjoying a cafe latte. Um, so, in that way, you can really deliver real-time information to the right people at the right time, at the right location, wherever it may be. And um, the data that we're talking about uh, typically is, is data coming from uh, rig surface sensors, um, things like uh, hook load, pit levels, uh, torque, weight on bit, etc. Um, sensor data, by the way, from sensors that have been mainly were already developed in the 1950s and 60s, and, and uh, they need to be upgraded. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. Um, also, data coming from downhole sensors, from the downhole telemetry, what we call measurement while drilling and logging while drilling tools um, that um, are, um, are being brought to surface and, and give us information about the downhole environment. And all that data is accumulated, is um, communicated through usually uh, suitable data communication systems for, for offshore rigs. Those are typically satellites. And then... Um, brought into the RTOC. Um, I wanted to give you some some um, typical examples of of well data visualization and the value it can bring. Um, I'm assuming that not all of you are familiar with um, with oil field applications, but just uh, stick with me, and I'll I'll guide you through it. Um, this um, graph that you see over here is monitoring flow on connections. Every time we've drilled a length of drill pipe down, and we need to add a length, we stop and uh, we monitor how much flow is coming back from the well. And that is very important to, uh, to determine if the well is actually flowing or not, if the well is kicking, if we are seeing an influx of formation liquids and um, in this case, uh, we are dealing with a well that is breathing, it's a fracture breathing well. Um, it's a well where we've pressurized some fractures down hole, and once we take the hydrostatic load off the overhead, these fractures give us the fluid back. It's a bit of a difficult situation uh, for us to deal with because it mimics the effects of a true well control event. And uh, by overlaying this data, one connection after another, we can distinguish a true well control event, a true kick, from this rather harmless fractured breathing um, 
behavior. And what you see there um, uh, in the different colors is indeed these backflow signatures. Um, they uh, taper off, and that's a good thing, except when we get close to about 12,000 feet depth, you see the red curve is different. The red curve seems to follow the other signatures, but then uh, there at, at um, 546, um, this is in minutes, uh, suddenly there's an acceleration of the backflow coming from the well, and that, that is a true kick. And through this, through this visualization of this data, it's readily available at the rig site, we can actually do some very good early kick detection. In fact, this, this uh, kind of monitoring can be automated. And, um, and you can uh, put in place uh, suitable alarm systems that, that uh, informs the crew that something is wrong with the well. Um, second example that I have for you is what is called a, a hook load plot. Hook load is essentially a, a measurement of the weight, the effective weight of the drill string. And the drill string has two different weights, um, a weight running into the hole which we call the slack off weight, and a weight coming out of the hole, and, and that's what we call the pickup weight. And uh, the difference between those two weights is essentially um, the amount of friction uh, that is acting in different directions, um, depending on the direction in which the pipe is moving. And in this plot, what you see is, is hook load versus depth, and you see two drawn lines, which are the model predictions for hook load, for slack off weight, that's the orange line, and for pickup weight, and that's the blue line. And because we are doing this this type of um, modeling pretty much for every run of every drill string, for every run or every casing string, uh, we've become very good at it. Uh, you can do with some really hard quantitative modeling. And in this particular plot, uh, we are overlaying the real-time data onto model. So the blue and, and pink dots that you see there are the real-time data um, that, um, that are overlaid on, on the model data. And what you can also see is that until a depth of about 14,000 feet, there is very good uh, quantitative agreement between the model prediction and the real-time data. But thereafter, there is a discrepancy. The slack off data is lower than what it should be. The blue points are below the orange line. And the pickup data is higher than what it should be. The, the pink dots are uh, distinctly above the blue line. And uh, this, to the trained eye, indicates that there is something wrong with the well. There is an obstruction in the well. Uh, something is grabbing the pipe. Um, uh, particularly when, when, when tipping out of the hole, uh, this could be still a, a bed of cuttings, for instance, in a deviated well that needs to be cleaned out. Um, this gives us a clear indication some remedial action need to be, needs to be taken because if we take this, this situation and we, we don't remedy it, we run casing, for instance, in the hole, there is a high risk of that casing uh, getting stuck. And a stuck pipe event on an offshore rig, this was done for a, a Gulf of Mexico deep water offshore rig, is a very costly, um, very cost intensive uh, event, typically on the order of several several million dollars to ten million dollars or more. Um, so doing this type of rather simple, almost passive visualization comparison of actual versus plan is tremendous, adds tremendous value. This alone for Shell was adding more than $100 million a year in, in, in value uh, just by the prevention of stock pipe events for global um, global deep water wells. Um, I have another example here. Here's an example uh, of actually the same thing, the hook load plot, where uh, you see a good quantitative agreement between the uh, model data and the real-time data. So this is a, is a positive case where you see that everything is as it should be. Now, the last case that I want to show you on, on well data visualization comes from the BP Macondo well. This comes from the uh, investigation report that was done on, uh, on Macondo. 
and uh, begin to show you the tremendous value that is in data monitoring and, and visualization, even in its simplest forms. Uh, there are a number of lines on this on this plot. It's a, a, a pressure and flow rate versus time uh, plot, and it's the plot shows uh, the behavior of the well about an hour before gas came to surface and explosions ripped through the, the platform and, and caused the ultimate demise of, of 11 people and, um, and of course, doomed, doomed the rig and, and started the uh, environmental disaster. Um, at, at this point, the rig is, is transferring fluid. It, it's circulating uh, heavyweight mud out of the well and taking that mud from the surface immediately to the supply boats, um, circulating seawater into the well. And um, what you see is some pit level sensors there. Uh, there is a yellow curve and, um, and, and you see a blue curve and a green curve. And those curves are kind of all over the place because fluids are being transferred, they're being circulated out of the well and then going overboard to the supply boats. Um, and it's very difficult to make any sense of those pit level sensors. Uh, the monitoring that I showed you in the first graph in fact, it's very hard to do on, on these pit level sensors. But there's another graph on that, on that curve, and that's that yellow line that you see. That the yellow line is the drill pipe pressure or the stand pipe pressure. And that drill pipe pressure from about 9 o'clock onwards shows an increase. In fact, after 10 past 9, you see it, it starts to increase rather dramatically. And this is still about 45 minutes before gas is coming to surface and, and, and the tragedy happens. Um, the, um, the, the standby pressure is going up, which is a really strange uh, thing. Uh, we are circulating very dense fluid out of the well for light fluid. Um, the standby pressure, the drill pipe pressure, is a function of the friction that a fluid experiences once it's circulated. A dense fluid has a much higher friction than a light fluid, such as seawater. What you would expect is the drill pipe pressure to go down when we circulate seawater into the well, but instead what we're seeing is that the standby pressure is going, going up. And um, the, the fact that the, the standby pressure is going up indicates that there is something wrong with the well, that the well is not under control, that indeed gas and oil is entering into the well and ultimately into the riser. And, uh, and, and, and BP had this data, this data was available, was in fact available in BP's real-time operating center. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that that operating center was not monitored 24-7. Uh, it was monitored from 9 o'clock in the morning to 5 p.m. in the afternoon, and that's when the people left. And, um, but, but the data was definitely there, and, and if it would have been monitored, if it would have been seen, then uh, certainly uh, uh, preventative action could have been taken that could have saved potentially 11 lives. So that shows you the tremendous value, the tremendous importance of parameter monitoring uh, that can be achieved these days. And uh, to BP's credit, uh, they have really changed their practices right now. They are monitoring these type of parameters now 24-7. You can go to their real-time operating center in, in Houston and they have one of the most sophisticated real-time operations, um, monitoring operations running on, on anything associated with well control. So they've, they've definitely seen the value of this type of well, well data visualization. Um, this, this well visualization is, is going to go on. Um, we're taking data from the visualization systems these days and plugging it into sophisticated software on the back end sophisticated software that actually allows us to analyze patterns in data automatically and tell us if we are going to run into trouble events. Um, here is an example of uh, what is called case-based reasoning. Um, uh, case-based reasoning is um, a way in which uh, data trends, data information is um, essentially captured in cases and then real-time data is compared to these cases 
and a kind of hard quantitative comparison is made between the actual real-time data and the historical case. That historical case could be a trouble event, it could also be a positive event, it could be optimum drilling conditions, for instance, and then uh, through these, uh, these bullseye plots that you see over here, kind of a hard quantitative comparison is made, showing you what the likelihood is that a case is uh, going to repeat itself, that a trouble event is going to repeat itself. And that, of course, allows you to take uh, appropriate uh, mitigation and, and evasive uh, action. And, and those techniques are now starting to be matured in, uh, in the oil and gas industry to, um, to really, in a very automated way, uh, alert operators that uh, things are not as they should be on their, on their various drilling rigs. Um, the, the second thing that I want to briefly talk to you about is, is uh, the rig automation. Um, the oil industry is, is, an, is a fascinating place, uh, place to be. It, it is uh, a place where tremendous sophistication happens. If you go to uh, ultra deep water, uh, sixth generation um, drill ships in the Gulf of Mexico, you, you'll see technology there that rivals that of, of space flight. On the other hand, you could um, go to um, drilling rigs operating in, uh, in the Permian, in, in Midland, Odessa, and, and you would uh, uh, swear that you would be caught in a time warp because you would be transported back to the early part of the 20th century. And um, so what we see, for instance, with respect to the adoption of automation is that this has uh, t really taken flight in other industries, in the automotive industry. I mean, no cars are, are being spray painted anymore by hand. This is all done by, by robots. Uh, these days, um, if you look at the defense industry, um, 50 years ago, um, Second World War, all manual, all human life at stake. These days, uh, predator drones are, are controlled um, in, in real time from um, half, half a planet away uh, without any problems. Um, even on the, uh, in the oil and gas industry, on the chemical um, oil and gas and, and, and power, you know, the downside of the business, um, field operators have been largely replaced by SCADA systems that are controlled from, from central control rooms. And um, that level of sophistication that has happened on the downstream side has, has not uh, transferred effectively to, uh, to the upstream side. And, and this is my uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek view on, on, on this, where you know, 50 years ago, um, you see the, the picture on the left, and then today, um, find the eight, uh, eight differences between the two, and, and, and in fact there are none. Um, the, uh, the business, uh, especially for, for U.S. land rigs in certain places, is pretty much conducted the way it was done 50 years ago. Some, some innovations have happened. Uh, we, we use top drive systems. We've gone from mechanical rigs to DC rigs and AC rigs and, and, and so on, but still... Uh, drilling these days, especially on land, is largely a manual process with people in harm's way interacting with large mechanical equipment and, and, and so on, with a large degree of inefficiency. Uh, that needs to change, we feel. Um, I'm, this is a slide of my good friend uh, Mark Anderson um, at Shell, and, and in one slide he kind of indicates what what the different requirements are that we will put on the driller. And as you can see, it's a lot. Um, and there's a lot of, of things that we ask the driller to do all at the, at the same time. And um, some drillers are very good, very proficient, but we are humans, we are all fallible, even the best of us have bad days. Um, Machines are just much more efficient at executing these kind of tasks than, than, than humans are. So it provides a compelling reason to, uh, to automate. And um, I, at, uh, at UT, have started a multidisciplinary collaboration with, um, with some, um, some scientists from other disciplines, particularly mechanical engineering and, and aerospace engineering. And um, we've uh, formed a, um, a rig automation group. Um, I have some pretty unique capabilities right now at UT um, to do some very nice uh, nice research and development in the area.
area of drilling automation. So um, just an overview of that. Um, at, at UT, uh, I've built the first uh, academia-based real-time operating center where we're streaming data in from uh, from operators and, and analyzing that, using it also as a data conduit into the university. Uh, I was very fortunate enough to get a very sizable donation from a company called uh, NOV, National Oil of Arco, and they gave me one of their state-of-the-art drilling simulators that you see on the lower lower left, uh, fully um, PLC controlled uh, drilling simulators. So it's almost as if you are controlling a real drilling rig, but then in virtual space. Uh, on the right, we have access to a test well, um, actually in the basement of our building that uh, we are instrumenting and that we will use for uh, for certain automation tasks. And then I'm still heavily involved in uh, in seeing if UT could get its own drilling rig, um, a donation from Shell. Um, uh, rig that we would put out in the field and that we would use for training purposes, for training the next generation of uh, drilling engineers, as well as doing drilling automation um, uh, research. Um, and, and as I said, uh, it's very important that uh, that this is a multidisciplinary effort. Um, I'm actually working more with the mechanical engineers on these type of projects than, than with the petroleum engineers. I really need the background, the expertise. On, uh, on things like mechatronics, robotics, from uh, from mechanical engineering and, and the typical petroleum engineering discipline. Um, uh, the nice thing about UT is um, it's it's uh, it's like being a kid in a candy store, but has such tremendous breadth of expertise and, and capabilities. Uh, there is the Texas Advanced Computing Center, for instance. The uh, uh, the Stat cluster has just come online, and that gives you tremendous. Um, uh, capability for doing very sophisticated data acquisition and, and, and high-speed data analysis. So we'll be leveraging TAC uh, in, in the coming years for things like data collection, analysis, uh, uh, automation, simulation research, and so on. Um, we are targeting these uh, what are called 10 levels of, of automation. Um, this is a definition by Shannon and Treplank. That they came up with in 1978, going all the way from level one, where the computer offers no assistance, the human must take all decisions and actions, all the way to level 10, where the computer decides everything and acts completely autonomously. And there are various levels in between where um, the computer actually uh, acts as an advisory system um, and, and, and aids the human. And there are opportunities for automation all throughout this uh, this space. Um, we are focusing on essentially through sophisticated software, through sophisticated control algorithms, having two-way communication to the rigs. So going away from just data acquisition using WITS and WITS and now and getting that passively in an RTOC, actually using an RTOC for a remote control of SCADA systems at the rig site um, and doing that in a very interdisciplinary way, um, doing it evolutionary and not necessarily revolutionary, using industrial systems that we leverage out of other industries, really reducing the burden on the operator, uh, the drawer primarily, and, and thereby really create a much safer environment, taking people out of harm's way as other industries have, have done. Now think about the defense industry example that I've just given you. What the defense industry has done is really take people out of harm's way. And that's what I would like to do also on, on, on the drilling side. So um, evaluating both fixed and flexible uh, aut automation systems. Um, and um, so uh, I, I'm not going to delve very deeply into this, but uh, so our work into this is is uh, building sophisticated, uh, uh, complex uh, control systems, kind of feedback controls with uh, with high degree of supervisory decision making ability uh, for drilling processes, how to drill in an automated way, how to pick up pipe and and not have humans involved, and and so on, how to really drill a well to, to depth, 
and and do that uh, in a largely automated way. And, and one of my collaborators, uh, Dr. Bechet uh, Ashid Meshe, has joined us recently from uh, from JPL, from the Jet Propulsion Lab, where he was on the team that actually um, uh, developed the control algorithm that helped the Curiosity robot land on Mars. And that, of course, had to be a fully automated um, solution because uh, data communication with with Mars uh, is, is just takes about a lifetime of about 15 minutes. So you're too late for real-time control. You can't steer that lander um, in real time. It has to work all by itself. And that's actually a very difficult control problem to, to solve, but uh, an approach in aerospace that uh, we think will lend itself really well to, for instance, automated directional drilling in the oil and gas field. And again, that's where um, software by Indusoft could be a real, really important where you remotely control SCADA systems through, for instance, the OPC UA standard. Um, quite a bit of work that we're doing with respect to sensors and analysis of big data. We've developed algorithms, for instance, that can automatically tell you if rig sensors are giving you valid data or not. And that's, of course, a key step in, um, in using that data for automation purposes. Something that you do or not want to do is that your control systems are starting to make autonomous decisions based on bad data. Um, so I think we think this is a key step forward where we can actually determine if, if data coming from big sensors is valid and can be used without problems or, or not. Um, ultimately, what we want to do is, is um, also using our own test capability that we hope to have is uh, implement um, more automated systems on, on fit-for-purpose rigs, rigs that are really built for the task uh, at, at hand, and, and those rigs are now starting to appear. They look nothing like uh, what a conventional drilling rig uh, looks like. Uh, you see some examples here on, on the lower left, this, this very light footprint uh, VR500 rack and pinion rig, uh, a very simple rig system, but with a fully automated pipe handler. No humans are involved. Nobody's on the drill floor when it comes to pipe handling and, and making and breaking out pipe. On the right, there is the, uh, the drill neck system, a uh, system with, again, an, on, an o automated, fully automated uh, uh, capability for pipe handling, uh, where pipe is stacked in a carousel around the drill floor, and an automated pipe handle is coming out and, and just uh, picking up signals of, of, of drill pipe and, and bringing them to well center and making up the pipe in a fully automated way. Um, uh, the last slide that I have is, is an example of a, a, a so-called log 400 rig by, by a company called Hausmann, um, which is again a fully uh, PLC controlled rig uh, with an automated pipe handling system. Uh, it looks no better near what, what you would expect for a, a, a regular rig. This is a fully modularized system um, that can be moved without cranes, has very little human interaction. Uh, in order to, uh, to to drill effectively, and you'll see more and more of those those systems in in the future, where the oil and gas industry is catching up um, with other industries, and uh, and where we are really leveraging the uh, what is available in terms of software uh, capability um, as as provided by by Indusoft's uh, systems and, and others. And that's uh, what I have for you um, this morning. Andre, I don't know if, uh, if, if there is uh, room for questions or... Uh... Yes, yes, actually, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Eric. That's extremely, extremely interesting. Uh, I want to add that uh, we uh, one of the slides, uh, Dr. Eric has shown the vertical trend object, and that's something that we, uh, with Indusoft Web Studio, that's one of the differentials that we have for this industry. So uh, if you insert... Uh, a trend chart on the Indusoft screen, you can define that's going to be horizontal or vertical. And that's a difficult thing to find out there. Mainly to find it inside a product that you don't need to put any add-on or anything like that. So 
that's uh, another thing that you guys see how uh, <coughs> in the software studio can fit in most of these applications that Dr. Eric was showing to us. So now we are open for the uh, Q&A session. Let me uh, check here. You guys gonna have a panel there where you can put your uh, your questions. So uh, let's see what we have here. Depending on your questions, gonna be either me or Dr. Eric who's gonna answer. So if you go on the uh, WebEx panel up there, you're gonna have the chat and you're gonna have the Q&A session, the Q&A panel. So just send your questions in and uh, we're gonna answer them, okay? Usually we give it at least a minute or two before the first questions come. That's people thinking about what they're gonna ask and you know actually typing their questions. In the meantime, uh, Dr. Eric, uh, that's everything that you were showing there. That, that's extremely interesting, and uh, the the graphic on the BP accident, you know, showing the curves and uh, how the automated system could have picked up everything and warned people that. They were in a dangerous situation and uh, you know using a SCADA system what that's one of the things that Indusoft can offer as well you can have automated uh, alarms sending to your cell phones to your emails and things like that so it <clears throat> could help avoid that accident again yeah well, well one, one of the things one of the important things indeed with respect to alarms is, is that you do it well Right, and you, you, you give out relevant alarms. Um, uh, some of the rudimentary systems that are available right now lead to alarm overload. You have kind of beeping sounds, flashing lights all the time, and at some point the operators are going to be ignoring that, uh, right. of course, because uh, most of it is uh, um, kind of false, false alarms. So it, it's a very important um, that if, if alarms are given out, then that is, it is the real thing, and, and it requires attention. Um, so sophistication in alarm systems and really analyzing trends accurately and filtering out false positives is is extremely important in, in, in that regard. It's not as simple as just building an alarm system. That, that is fairly easy to do, but to come up with something that actually, that actually works and that, um, uh, that works well is, uh, is quite something else. No, um, I, but as I said already from, from the BP example, right, just, just um, just having eyes on that data, just having a person maybe just looking at that and recognizing what is going on and, and raising an appropriate alarm, um, in that case would have been of tremendous value. And it could have prevented uh, what, what actually transpired. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And uh, we have, you know, uh, real uh, experiences with people that they want to alarm absolutely everything. So you end up banalizing the alarms. Like uh, the user gonna look on the screen, gonna see like 15 messages, and some of them are just little warnings or things like this, and they will just ignore them when maybe one of those messages are is really important. <clears throat> so one of the things that we uh, can do with Insoft Web Studio on the alarm system, if you are using uh, remote monitoring, if you're using web thing clients, if you're using this local monitoring or a control room, is that you can associate different priorities, different colors for the different alarms. So let's say you're gonna have warnings. You can display them uh, with, let's say, a, a yellow background and, uh, and uh, black fonts, you know? And then depending on the well, you're gonna put a different color. And you can put the really important alarms in red background, so they're gonna call your attention, you know? And uh, with Insoft Web Studio, you can configure different colors, different priorities for all the alarms that you're gonna have, you know? So if you wanna still have alarms for everything, Okay, you can display all that, but the most important ones, the ones that really require attention, you can put on a different color and they can go to the top of the uh, alarm control if they happen. And you can also do, again, the automated uh, messaging system. So whenever the alarm happens, we can automatically send messages out depending on the importance of the alarms, okay? Here we have our contact information. If you need to send us an email with any questions, anything related to this webinar or general questions, you got here, you can send either to info at inusoft.com or to uh, our support email, technical questions. You're gonna have technical people answering them. Support at inusoft.com. If you have commercial overall questions, you can send to info at inusoft.com. We are showing the numbers. We have three offices. 
uh, one in Sao Paulo, Brazil, one in Germany, and our headquarters here in USA. So here are the numbers you can call and ask any questions. All the offices, they speak English as well as the local languages, okay? And uh, once again, oops, I clicked on the link. This is our website, you know, where you can see all the case studies that we mentioned as well. So a big thank you from all of us here at Indusoft. Thank uh, you, our very, very special guest, Dr. Eric. We're going to uh, speak again in a few hours in the afternoon, but it was really, really interesting. Thank you very much for taking your time to present all that and to teach us all those very very interesting lesson that you just did and uh, i'm gonna talk to you guys on the next webinar you stay tuned there is still very interesting thing on the way all right thank you very much